that in the spirit is being dug for evidence. And it's uncovering hidden things, uncovering monuments, uncovering things around the world. But the search is on for evidence. And it's time because God's people are calling for evidence. Show what's happening, Lord. Show the world what's going on. Show the people what's happening, Lord. And so in the spirit, angels are digging for evidence. They're uncovering evidence everywhere. Look for things. Look for things. Look for things to take place. Things to be discovered. People to be discovered. And you'll know the hunt is on. because it can't be afforded to be told. So it'll just be a rumor. Is this it? Is this it? Some will say yay, some will say nay. But the fact that the rumor is out, yeah, evidence.
sounds I'm hearing. Yes. Trying to equate to the sound of digging, the sound, a sound in the Mideast, a sound Hezbollah has boiled. Hezbollah has boiled. A plague. A boil. Boiling sounds. One ends, another begins. It ends, another happens. In the Mideast. Israel is mine, says the Lord. Jacob is mine. He was promised the name and given Israel. Israel is mine. Israel. and show in the music yes and in the scratching of records yes and the people involved yes
When this crap is going to end, says the Lord, the abusing of my children, the abusing of the little ones, when I said it was better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you be cast into the depths and drowned in the depths of the sea, I wasn't kidding, says the Lord. I wasn't playing games with you. I wasn't just giving you a metaphor. I was telling you it would be better for you than what awaits you. For I've seen the screams and the cries of the little ones. I've seen them. I've seen them as they called out to me. And I've seen them as I received them back into my arms. I have seen them. And I've seen them over and over and over. But your time has now come. It is over for your kind. It is done in this time. For I am going to show you what's hidden in the sand. I'm going to show you what is lying on borders. I'm going to show you what is happening around the world. And it will end, 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 says the Lord. It will. his people to know today that no matter what the turmoil is in the world or the evil that you see in the world that God hasn't forgotten us he has not forgotten us and he has not forgotten you no matter where you are right now it don't make any difference where you are if you're in prison if you're in some foreign land that you can't get home to your homeland, wherever that may be, he hasn't forgotten you. Just look toward him. And I hear this in my spirit. Look toward the east. And the Lord said, your deliverance will come from that direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now that's a prophetic word for somebody. Look toward the east. It'll come from that direction. Amen. Amen. And I'm getting a, 
just like a whisper across my spirit again about another balloon, another, uh, I want to say a blimp, but I always see that. It's like a, and maybe I don't always see that, but it's, it's that, some, some air balloon. I see that. And it's just like a, a, just a whisper came across, just real faintly. That means it's a long way from me or either it's a ways off yet. But I heard it, and I heard it coming. And uh, I saw this snake's face, and it, it's hissing, and it's, it's hissing, but it's a ways off. And that's all it's going to do. Just don't be afraid of that. It's just, it just, it's just hissing. It looked like a cobra type, but it's just hissing, just trying to intimidate. Hallelujah. God, you know, the serpent that worked with Moses was bigger than the serpents that worked with Pharaoh. <laughs> it was. And Moses' rod rose to meet every occasion needed. Did you ever notice that? It was a Nakash in front of the burning bush. It was a Tanim in front of Pharaoh. And it, it was held up and parted the sea. It was held above his head and his hands raised up and so forth. And battles are won. And it always rose to every occasion. The word of God will rise to every occasion to preserve and save you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I would advise... It would be advice for what it's worth to these people. Wicked government officials that will attack prophets, you should probably rethink that. Uh, I heard the Lord say that. You just should rethink it. And if it's that, surely it just needs to be rethought. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, what a time. What a time we're in. We'll be right back, and we're going to hear what God's going to say today on the 11th hour. It is the 11th hour, and we are glad you're here. Hallelujah. So today we stand on a mountain that is remembered in all of history, probably the most important battle. It, it has all the earmarks. It reminds you of the American Indian and their last stands, different places, tribes. So today up here, I'm instructed to stretch my staff out. That's why I came up here with it. I'm not, I'm not on this tour for pleasure. I came to every side on purpose. And so, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet to the United States, a prophet to the Indian nations, and a prophet to Jerusalem. And the Lord has sent me here to declare peace and safety and protection over this land. We have to have it now, and they need it now. And this is a special place to God. It is the cradle of life, so to speak. 
you don't think life proceeds from here to everywhere, you haven't been listening. Hallelujah. Now, Lord God, we, we pray over Israel. Lord God, I lift, I lift this nation up, Lord, before you now. Here on this high place, Lord, here where so much death has been remembered. But Lord God, there is a, a declaration of life never again. So Lord, we proclaim never again. We proclaim never again. And we call for peace. Peace. In the name of Jesus, I call for peace. And where there was a curse, Lord God, that would cause the enemy to come against this again. Lord, we speak an oasis again, a, a life over the land. So peace, peace, Lord, protect this nation on every border. Rise up, Lord, and let the enemies of Israel see angels on all four corners of the nation. Let them see angelic beings and stop their war machines. Lord, this is not the time for this to happen. I call for great revival in this land. That, Lord God, there will be a revival of Yeshua, of Mashiach. Lord, you have sent me here as a prophet, and I could weep standing in this place. Lord, because I sent your hand here. And so, Lord, stretch your hand over Israel and protect the prime minister and protect those that are, that are on his side and for this nation and weed out the corrupted ones that they will leave. And Lord God, I give you praise and I give you honor and I give you glory, Lord, for you are God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Lord, these are your people. And I thank you for salvation in Jesus' name. Let the, let the weather fight for them. Let the weather, like in the days of Elisha, let the weather fight. If necessary, fire fall like Elijah. Let it fight for them. If necessary, let the ravens feed them. Protect the land. You gave it to Abraham forever. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for deliverance at this time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Danny, which direction is Jerusalem from where I'm standing? This way? I speak peace, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the peace. Say it. Peace over Jerusalem. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Now let's praise our God for deliverance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, brother. We're gonna add rain to that. Rain, hallelujah. Welcome you back to the 11th hour today, and uh, it is a day that God wanted to comfort his people. He wanted to comfort his people and let you know 
that he hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten me. He hasn't forgotten, though, you know, though it looks like darkness is encroaching everywhere, that doesn't mean God is not around. God is here. The darkness goes at his feet. That doesn't mean that he has forgotten us. And he wanted his people to know that today. Uh, things that happened happening around the world, uh, tragedies, disasters, and, and all of that happening. The Lord hasn't forgotten us. And though there's attacks on freedom, you can see in the spirit that's what happened in there by the bridge that was hit. The enemy is, has his attack on freedom. Uh, Francis Scott Key and, and what, what he has written and so forth. And, and so it's an attack on freedom. It's symbolic of these things. And, um, but God wants you and I to know, you know, say, can you see? our precious anthem. Now, I want you to see this. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says, To everything there is a time, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to cry, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to to speak, and we're in that time, a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate. Listen to this, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? See what it says here in verse 8, a time to love and a time to hate. And then it says, well, uh, in verse 7, a time to speak. This is where we are. We're in a time to speak. And in this time to speak, there's a time to love and a time to hate during this time and a time of war. We see that happening and a time of peace. So that's what's coming. So in this time that we live in right now, there's a time and a season for every purpose under the heaven. In other words, it's been sown for <laughs> and it's coming up. And that's why all these times are involved. And so, listen to this. Time is an entity that will one day be no more. The scripture says that the day will come when time will be no more. So, during this time we're in, under the heaven, in this dispensation, time is highly sought after. It's highly sought after. See, time will make a thrust toward the end during the thousand-year millennial reign. Time is highly sought after. It's a highly sought after commodity because there's a time for every purpose under the heaven. And if time can be seized, and you know, that's been man's cry, man's, they always constantly want to Travel time, manipulate time. Time is a dimension. They're looking for time, and they, they want time. You know, the Scripture talks a lot about it. It says when Jesus came walking across the water, it says when, they got, when he got to the boat and got in the boat, immediately they were to the other side. Time was removed from the factor. Time was removed. When he got in the boat, until he got there, this storm just kept going and kept going and kept going. But when he got there, immediately it went to the other side. So time is something that's highly sought after. It's a commodity. The scripture says, in the beginning, God created. That's time. The beginning. That's time. It speaks of time. The evening and the morning were the first day, time. Second day, time, third day, time, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all time. 
See, time was cut out and put into this realm. And in this time, did you realize that time defeats every army in the world? That's the only thing that can beat no matter who comes out, no matter what, every day they get older. No matter how a dictator tries to scream and rain and, and, and call himself a god, yet every hour he grows older and time is chipping away at him or her. Time keeps pulling. It's chipping away. It defeats every army that's ever walked the earth. It defeats every uh, edifice ever built. It defeats every machine ever built no matter what you'll see time take its toll on it time and everything in the material war, uh, world is at war with each other constantly you see metal start to rust that's time over time it breaks down you have to go to great lengths to try to secure time in an area they bury time capsules so they can see what happened at another time. The Chronicles of the Kings in the Scripture is a record of the time that king lived on the earth. Because one day, make no mistake, one day all kings will stand before God. And when the books are opened and it's said, this is what happened in this time. Who was the king at that time of this nation? It's chronicled. Kings' lives have to be chronicled. Time. Time is an entity that one day will be no more. The scripture declares time will be no more. Time will make a thrust toward the end, the thousand year millennial reign. Time is a highly sought after commodity. It is to be factored in to win battles, coordinating attacks, to inform people when to gather, to inform people when to leave. Time is on a course to be no more. So, every hour, every minute of every day is valuable to people and spirits. Men need it. Demons want it. And Satan fights for it. Time. The demons with the madman of Gadara said this to Jesus. Have you come to torment us before the time? Time is sought after. Every day is valuable because every day it's running out. And so it's sought to be manipulated. And so there's a time and purpose for every season under heaven. That's why the occult constantly tries to manipulate and seize time. They're trying to seize this time. They're trying, to, a one world regime trying to push into this earth. They've got to seize time to do it. Daniel 7, 25 declares that he seeks, he thinks to change times and laws. He's constantly after time. You and I are the ones with the power within us to speak to the sun and moon as Joshua did and say, sun, stand thou still, moon, stand thou still, or get in the boat and, and call on that time to be immediately to the other side. We can say like Hezekiah did to Isaiah. Isaiah said, do you want the sundial to go forward 10 degrees or backward 10 degrees? And it was Hezekiah that said, let it go backward and correct the past. We can now, we have that power on the inside of us. These demonic forces that are arrayed against us, they're trying to manipulate the time. This is why you see what's happening in Russia. This is why you see the ship do what it did. This is why you see things shaping up in, in, in Ukraine, Mideast, all these nations. They're trying to control and corral time to get something inside this time that can't be changed. It says in Daniel 7, 25 that the enemy wants that three and a half years. There's three and a half years in the book of Revelation where the prophets keep that beast in the pit. If he could get out before that three and a half was up, he could start with a lot more and accomplish what he wants. So time is a, is a thing to be redeemed. 
The scripture says redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now, you think about that. He wants us to redeem time because the days are evil. Redeem time, days speak of time. So we are to redeem time because they're trying to do time in, in the day of evil. So we're to redeem it. Hallelujah. So how do we redeem it? Well, right now we're in the time to speak. So we begin to speak. Speak out the word of God. Speak it into the heavens. Speak it into the airwaves. Speak it everywhere you go. Begin to speak in this time of war. Speak love. Hallelujah. We are to redeem the time. So every minute of every day is valuable to people, spirits. Men need it, demons want it, and Satan fights for it. Because the scripture says he's, he comes down in great fury because he knows his time is short. He knows his time is short. See, now, we are in the time and the season that the enemy is trying to build a one-world regime. Now, I'm talking about spiritual things, but you can see it showing up in governments everywhere. There's just certain things. There's a collision. There's a fight happening to move things around because there's only a certain time to get it done. And you and I are the ones with the power in us to speak to time. So today on this program, we are going to call for the redemption of our time. We're going to call for time to be redeemed, for time to go back, for time to be stopped, for whatever it needs for our victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, I, you know, I know, well, Brother Robin, this is super heavy. I, I know it. I know it's heavy. I know it is. See, it's just like this. Um, you know, yeah, let me, let me get here to something I want to say. Yeah, all right, I will. To try and overcome a prophetic word given by the creator himself is a futile thing. To try and overcome a prophetic word that the creator himself has given is futile. To do so, you have found yourself fighting against God himself. Regardless of what people may claim to believe or not believe, when it comes right down to it, they live and die while God and his word remains forever. I want to say that again. Regardless of what people claim to believe or not believe, they can say, well, there is no God, there is no power of God, there is no such thing as prophetic events and so forth. But when it comes right down to it, they live and die because time just takes it from them. They live and die while God and his word remains forever. It's timeless. See, two nations were created on the love of God, Israel and America. Israel because God loved Israel, America because we loved God. The words of the evil hierarchy in this time are laced with occult overtones. It's easy to see if one knows what they're listening for. Every generation claims to be the modern generation. Yet during a lockdown, <laughs> toilet paper replaced money in this so-called modern generation. Prophecy from the Most High, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, comes from the place of no sin. That is from tomorrow. Why is it the place of no sin? Because man hasn't arrived there yet to bring his corruption. Nothing can overcome the prophetic word given from the throne of God. It was prophesied, speaking of Israel, that a nation would be born in a day. No one ever heard of a nation disappearing for 2,000 years and then in one day 
it was born again. Yet in 1948, it happened. Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51, it was prophesied that there would be a coalition of nations with a captain to lead them. And through this coalition, the Lord would bring upon the land of Babylon a destroying wind. We would say a desert storm. The Euphrates River is mentioned in the book of Genesis as one of the four rivers of biblical prophecy. It is mentioned over and over in the Bible. The Euphrates is a major prophetic road sign. In the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This prophetic river is now drying up at a phenomenal rate in the natural. No one in the past even thought this was possible. At this same time, China, one of the kings of the east, poses a tremendous threat. We right now have madmen like Klaus Schwab and Noah Harari openly speaking of creating a genetically altered race of people using computer chips and so forth. Harari says that soon we won't be human as we know human. He said it will one day be like a screen when it's pulled down and everything will change. He went on to say part of this will be done with implants of chips. He said if you don't get on board, they won't need you as a serf or a slave. Well, now the first in, uh, chip implant in the brain of a human has taken place. This all could be chalked up to nonsense except for the fact that the head of the World Economic Forum and his prophet Noah Harari is pushing it at a breakneck speed. The Lord told us of all this long ago. There's a one world, world order being pushed into being in front of our very eyes. The Great Reset, it's called. If we think this is all too far out, then we must ask ourselves, why was the throne of Satan mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, excavated, sent to Berlin on the very date Hitler was born in Austria? Why did Hitler have Albert Speer replicate it for his Nuremberg pedestal from which he uttered the words, Final Solution? Why did he earnestly seek the Ark of the Covenant? Why did he search for the Holy Grail? Why did he murder over six million Jews? And why did he try to create a super race? What does a history lesson of prophetic events have to do with this event today? Each and every one of, of you right now are prophetic players in the earth right now. You have no idea of your worth to God and what he is wanting to accomplish with you. Some say this is just a coincidence or the cravings of madmen, of a madman. The point being the ancient fight from the beginning has not changed. Men and women are caught up in, ancient, in an ancient fight whether they like it or not. In our generation, we have some similar questions to ask ourselves. For instance, why is the great LHC in Switzerland trying to open a door to another dimension? When asked about its purpose, they said if we can open it, something might step through it. The scripture says in Revelation 9 that when the bottomless pit is opened, the demonic forces that proceed from it have a leader over them named Apollyon. The large Hadron Collider in Switzerland is built on the temple of Apollo. Why is the false god Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction, standing outside the door of this facility? Why was the same false god sitting on the table in 2017 when China met with the WHO in Switzerland? Why did Barack Obama appear on the cover of Newsweek as this god, where the caption read, God of all things? Why was the Gothard Tunnel in Switzerland dedicated by replicating the ceremony of Pan in Caesarea Philippi? In 2016, thereabouts, then a pandemic came. Why did Hillary Clinton invite two of the most powerful witches in the world to the White House, where she channeled the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt? Questions such as these no one will ask, and certainly they will not answer. Yet if they had been asked and answered in the days of Hitler, we might have stopped so much. Hear the word of the Lord in this room today and over these waves. 
For I have raised you up for this time. You have always asked God to use you. Well, hear the word of the Lord. This is your time. Speak out now, says the Lord, for I am with you. No one will lay their hands on you to destroy you. Hear the word of the Lord. Trust me, and I will not fail thee. Rise up and be thou strong and very courageous, for I have brought you to this place for such a time as this. One cannot deny this in the face of child sacrifice of abortion. The ancient arches of Baal, the champion of child sacrifice, has been replicated and dedicated by heads of nations. In the dedication of the Gothard portal in Switzerland, the very ceremony of Pan was replicated and celebrated by over 100 government officials. Heads of nations, the confusion of genders, and even species. We see what the enemy's doing. I had prepared this word for a group of people. And the Lord never gave me leave to read it. And then today, he said, read it today. So now I know why. It was saved for such a time as this. And it's something that we're just coming out of the, out of the time of Purim. And the deliverance that Esther had brought to the whole Jewish people. And there was a wicked dictator named Haman looking to overthrow the king and manipulate ideas and laws. Think about it. Haman was manipulating times and laws. Because in Haman's day, remember this, it said they came before Haman and they cast poor of poor. They cast it, which is lot, the lot. And it said they came before him and started at the month Nisan and cast it for every day and every month to see what month he would destroy the Jews. And the day fell on in the month of Adar, or Adar. So he was manipulating, looking, watch now, for time, the right time. He was looking for the times. And then he had a law that he had manipulated and sealed it with the king's signet to destroy all the Jews. So you know Satan was, was leading this man. He was trying, he thought, to change times and laws. See, in the spirit world, and I'm speaking of the spirit. See, people, people oh, you know, they get, oh, they want. I'm talking about fighting in the spirit fighting in the spirit with the word of God because people are caught up in a prophetic narrative whether they know it or not God's prophecies will happen and they're not going to not happen we just need to get hold of that they're not going to not happen, and principalities hunt personalities constantly. A lot, of, a lot of people, probably politicians, a whole lot of them don't even have a clue what they're caught up in. But I'm convinced some do. Because Haman had his mind set to change a time, manipulate a law, to destroy God's people. You know what the scripture says? said he wanted to destroy Mordecai. Now watch how Satan uses the hate against one person. He said, Mordecai, see, when Haman came through, he was the king's right-hand man. You know what I said in Veggie Tales? Make way for Haman, the king's right-hand man. And, you know, the little grapes were carrying, the French peas were carrying him. And, you know, and he had on this gangster hat and all. But Haman wouldn't bow. All the, everybody bowed to Haman when he came by. Bow. Anybody comes up to you and says, bow to me. That's your first clue. They're full of horse crap. And so he was making everybody bow. But when he came to Mordecai, whoa, 
Mordecai just stood and looked at him. He's not bowing to Haman. Oh, it infuriated him. It, it enraged Haman with such a fiery rage. And he wanted to destroy Mordecai, but he thought it scornful, the Scripture says, to, to just destroy him. See, if he'd have just turned around and said, I'm just going to kill Mordecai, everybody would have, it, it looked, he would have drawn scorn for that. So here's his grand solution. Let's just kill them all. Let's kill all the Jews, he said. And I'll get Mordecai. He didn't even care if he killed. And it said little ones, women, children, little infants. It didn't, it didn't matter to him to get to that one. He wanted that man dead because that was a prophet that was hearing from God. He wanted him gone. And so Satan said, more, that was probably Haman's, his argument with his master overlord, the devil. I'll draw scorn if I just kill him. And Satan said, kill them all. Just take them all out. That's what he wanted anyway. Maybe we will kill the Messiah. We'll get rid of his line if we get them all. And so he set out to manipulate a law. And he took a law. And he said to the king, King, there's this group of people in your kingdom, but he won't tell him who. There's this group of people in your kingdom that absolutely... They're, they're just, they're scattered everywhere throughout your kingdom. And, and they, they don't think like you, king. They don't, they don't observe your laws. They, they worship their own, they do their own thing. And they're dangerous to you. The king says, really? Because he don't know. Yeah. And Haman is talking about the Jews. And the king don't know he's married to one. And so he hides the truth from the king. But he don't know he's married to one either. So he comes in and says, there's these Jews, and, but he don't call them Jews. It's just these people. The king said, what do we do about them? Well, we need to destroy them. Let's just wipe them out. They're not profiting you. That's what he said. There's no profit to the king. And it's obvious money was on the king's mind because Haman said, I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the king's treasury and I'll pay for it. The king said, well, here, here's this ring, here's this, you write whatever law you want in my name. When the king finds out, he don't have to pay for it. So the love of money is the root of all evil. And so he uses this money and he begins to do this and he sends out this decree and so he says, now we've got to have the perfect time to, in which to execute this. And so they come before him. He's got a law changed. Now he's got to have the time. He seeks and thinks to change times and laws. So he's, they start casting lots, the poor. They cast it. P-U-R, they cast it. And it, they go from the month Nisan, the first month. They go all the way through to the 12th month Adar. And it falls on that and it shows a sign that this is the day. He says, so it was set. And he sent it out to all the provinces. Now, can you imagine what would happen if all of a sudden you get up in the morning, you're a vital part of the kingdom of Persia, you're there in Shushan, the palace, you're all over everywhere, and you've got businesses, you're raising children, you're doing all kinds of things, good things, and you're benefiting the kingdom, and you get up, and in the newspaper that morning, it's the king's decree that all the Jews must die on this day of Adar. The babies, the infants, the babies, the, the teenagers, the women, the men, and all of their land seized by those who kill them. They can have them. That was their incentive to do it. Well, you can have their land. Whoever, however many Jews you kill, you can take their land. 
So everybody's ready. Can you imagine what was read? Mordecai saw it. He took off his, his nice clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes and he walked into the middle of the city wailing and crying and mourning. But Mordecai didn't stop there. He walked on into the gate of the king wailing and mourning and it was against the law for anybody to come in above, in the king's gate with sackcloth and ashes. You had to look like a horse fly when you came in his gate. That he comes in there screaming and wailing and the Jews all over the kingdom are wailing and, and out in the streets and they're crying. What would you be doing? I mean, your, whole, your blood would run cold if you saw that and you got up and your government posted or put it online or put it on a newspaper and you're reading it back when everybody read newspapers and you're looking at it and you're going to have your morning coffee and it says you, your whole family, your whole creed, your race, everyone must die. And they take your land and you can't even defend yourself. In other words, on that day, you walk out like Hitler in the gas chambers. On that day, they just walk out and die. Well, they're screaming, they're wailing, they're calling on God. And Mordecai, he just starts in, man. He's, he's just fearless. He don't care. It's the time to speak. This is the time to speak. There's a time and a purpose for every, the, a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. A time to be silent and a time to speak. It was time to be silent when Esther didn't tell the king she was a Jew. A Jewish, but on the day, now it's time to speak. And so Mordecai goes in wailing and interceding and crying before God and he goes on into the king's gate. And when he does, the king is, I mean, if the king finds out, he could be in real trouble. So Esther hears about it. They come and tell her. She's taken the name Esther. Her name is Hadassah. But she's taken the Persian name Esther. And so he come, they come and tell him, said, what? She hears he's in sackcloth. Ashes. She sends these nice clothes out there to him. He raised her. He's like her father. So he, she sends these clothes out. She don't want anything to happen to him. He refused them. She said, find out why. He told her. He handed that haytack. The, the one given to Esther to take care of her by the king, the eunuch assigned to her. He gives him the decree. She takes it, he takes it to Esther. And Esther sends back word. He says, you have to go before the king. You have to on behalf of your people. She sends back a command. They're, they're, they're communicating through these letters. Because he, a man's not allowed in the queen's chambers. Not unless it's her eunuch. And so he's sending back and forth these letters. He tells her this. He said, if you don't do this now, he said then, Deliverance will rise. It will come from some other place. But you and your father's house will not survive. Don't think because you're the queen you will, you will survive. You know why? Because the king had given an edict that the Jews would die. Do you realize, but people don't think about this, but anything, if it hadn't been changed, anything that was Esther's, whoever killed her could take it legally. And the king couldn't change it. Because the laws and the word of the king, the king of the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, could not be altered. So whatever Esther owned, if it's found out she's a Jew, when they kill her, they can take it, which is half the king's kingdom. 
I don't even know if anybody's really thought about that much. But they don't know she's a Jew. So now, half the kingdom is in jeopardy. And the Jews being wiped out. So all control of Persia, at least half of it. Remember the king told Esther, I'll give you half my kingdom. I mean, whatever she had was, was going to be whoever killed the Jew. So the king's throne was actually being protected by a Jew. How about that? He don't know it. And Haman has moved dangerously close to the throne now. One of Agag's descendants whom Saul wouldn't kill. A prophet had to kill him. Saul spared too much. And now they're about to reap what he spared. And so now the king's throne is in danger. And he don't even know it. Haman has moved dangerously close to the throne. That means Satan has. So Haman, it's all set. Esther has the decree. She sends word back to Mordecai. But the king has a law for everyone. If you approach his throne without being summoned by him, you die. Esther is absolutely letting everybody know once the law from the king is put out, it can't be altered no matter if you're the queen, no matter if you're the king. So if it's found out now that she's a Jew, <laughs> he can't even save her. So she says, Mordecai, said it's one law for everybody and he hadn't even called for me in 30 days. He said, well, if you think you'll escape, you won't. He said, but who knows if you wasn't brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's time to speak. You're in the time to speak. And if you hold your peace, the Lord will raise up Deliverance for the Jews from somewhere else, he said. For God's people. You could read it that way. But you and your father's house won't be saved. That's why I have to speak. I can't hold my peace from what I hear from the Lord. Because that's where your protection is, is what you speak. So... She reads that word, Haytack tells her. And so she reads that and she says, sends word back and says, tell all the Jews, all of them, to pray and fast for three days. Don't eat nothing, don't drink anything. That's pretty tough for three days, especially the water. And he said, don't eat or drink anything. I and my maids will do the same thing. Now you think about that. Her maidens are probably not Jewish, but they're going to do it anyway. So at the end of three days, she groomed herself, put, had all the royal apparel pull on, put on. She heads to see the king. And she told Mordecai, she said, I'm going to go in after three days. If I perish, I perish. You don't have any idea the nerve it took for her to walk into to that, to that throne room. Yet she goes in, the king, and she stands over to the side. The king sees her. She moves up toward him. He sees her. Don't you know everybody's holding their breath? Because it's, it's protocol. She dies unless... He holds out the golden scepter to her. Nobody knows what he's going to do. A monarch like that in those days, 
point his finger around the room and you'd be ducking because if he stopped on you and said, die, that's it. And he looks at her. Everybody's wondering. He takes his golden scepter and he stretches it to her. She comes forth and touches the end of it. And he says, Queen Esther, what is your request? He knows it's important she risked her life to get there. And he also knows that her love for him must be bigger than whatever's bothering. And she believes he'll spare her. And he's curious now. Think about it. He wants to know why she would risk her life to be there. And so she says, come to a banquet that I will hold for you and, and Haman. Oh, Haman's beaming with pride. <laughs> I get to kill all my enemies, all the Jews, get rid of Mordecai. And I get to eat dinner with the king and queen. Well, all this happens. Of course, the king can't sleep one night. So he's, he wants to hear the story of him. <laughs> the story of what his life has been like over the last year or so. And everybody followed him around constantly writing it down. I mean, imagine this. The king's going through the town. He's got his royal apparel on. He walks through the palace. He sees something. He reaches over and picks it up. The king reached over and picked up this thing on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. The king put it in his pocket at 3.01. The king walked out. The king went into a private room to use the bathroom at four. <laughs> Whatever. Everything he does is chronicled. Well, there happened to be a time uh, when a guy named Big Thin, Big Thin, I guess, I don't know how you say it, but him and his buddy going to kill the king. And so they're going to get rid of him. Mordecai overheard it. And warned Esther, and Esther warned the king, and they saved his life. And it was put down in the chronicles that the Jew Mordecai saved the king's life. Now, the king still don't know what's about to happen to Jews, just enemies. So he's, <laughs> he can't sleep. Somebody come in and read to me. His life is so boring, it'll put him to sleep. <laughs> you know? So come in and read to me. So the guy comes in, sits down, the king at this time. And then he's just reading through, and the king's probably looking around. And then all of a sudden he says, and the Jew Mordecai saved the king's life when he would be killed. And the king says, and then he goes on to the next subject. Wait a minute, hold it. He saved my life. Was anything ever done for him during that time? Was he rewarded for saving the king's life? No king. Man, don't you know the Lord is talking to this king? God is. You've got to reward him. You've got to reward him. How am I going to reward him? I mean, that's a big deal, saving the king's life. Well, call Haman. He'll tell you. <laughs> Send for Haman right now. I don't care what time it is. Send him in here. Haman comes in. Said there was a, a man. Uh, said what would be done for the king if a man saved his life? Or, or, or what would be done for a man who, no. He said what would be done for the man whom the king seeks to honor? If the king wants to honor a man, what would he do? What would you suggest? Haman, full of pride, said he can't be talking about anybody but me. I'll tell you what I'd do, king. And then he gets caught away in his own world. I would have a robe that the king has wore in public so everybody could see the king in public and wearing this robe. And I'd put it on the man. And I'd take the crown that a king has wore and put it on his head. And I'd put him on one of the king's horses. And in other words, he's going to look like the king. You think about this a minute when you start to realize that Esther was a Jew and when it's finally found out, Haman looks like he's trying to take over the kingdom. 
Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Because you can have whatever you take from the Jews. So it looks like Haman's plotted all of this in the end. Wearing the king's robe, the king's horse, the king's crown, taking over the queen's possessions, everything. It looks like he's after that kingdom, and he probably was. Because he's a liar. And so he's, he says, and I do all of this, and his eyes are probably big and glazed over. And the king's probably looking at him going, yeah, right, well, yeah, that's pretty cool. Do that for the Jew Mordecai. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, and he said, and you go see to it yourself. You lead him through the town. Because uh, uh, Haman had said, I, I didn't add this part, but Haman had said, and let him lead the man through the town and, and let someone, a noble, lead him through the town or somebody of importance declaring, this is the man to whom the king seeks to honor. This is what he does for the one he seeks to honor. He said, yeah, and by that time, Mordecai's probably doing this. I mean, I mean Haman's like this off in the, the dream world. And let him do that and say, this is who the king seeks to honor. And then he looks at the king. He's still in his fantasy world. And he sees himself and the king says, yeah, well, do that for the Jew Mordecai and you do it yourself. And you lead him. And I mean, Haman's broke out of his dream, daydream quick. He has to put the robe on Mordecai, the crown on Mordecai, on the king's horse he sets Mordecai, and he is leading him through the town. This is the man whom the king, thus does the, does the king for the man whom he seeks to honor. <laughs> Mordecai is probably riding that horse going. Now Mordecai knows God is at work here. He runs home. <laughs> he lays down and pouts. I, I had to, what, what are we going to do? Have a, one of his, his wife or one of his kids, I forget now which one it was, said his family said, build a gallows and, and put it 50 cubits or whatever it was and hang Mordecai on it. He said, yeah, that's what we'll do. And then he's over there pouting and screaming around because he had to lead Mordecai out and show him honor on the king's robe, king's crown, king's horse. And how he's doing all of this. And then he says, and his wife looks at him and says, you did that for Mordecai? Yes, I had to. She said, if you seek to destroy him, these people, you won't survive. You won't, you won't make it. So I seek this, is, I, I sense this is going to be bad for you. Haman looks at her. Then he don't realize he's late for the second banquet. Because the king had asked Esther in the first banquet, now we've come to the banquet. Tell me, queen, what it is that you want? I give it to you, half my kingdom. Come back tomorrow night, I'll tell you. So he forgets about this. These things are transpiring so fast. And Haman says, while he's doing that, you're late for the king's banquet, the queen's banquet. She's giving for the king. Oh, yeah, I'm late. He takes off. He gets over there. And when the banquet is over, the king says, queen, now make your request. What is it you want? What is it? Even to half my kingdom, as she starts pleading with the king, She said, King, I plead for the life of me and my people. She says, if we'd only been sold as slaves, I wouldn't say anything. But they're seeking to kill me and my whole people. Who would dare do this to the queen? She said, it's that wicked Haman. He's done it. He's decreed that the Jews be killed and so forth. And now all of a sudden it's known she's a Jew. 
Hadassah from the tribe of Benjamin. Haman, <laughs> his blood runs cold. You live in the time of monarchs at that time. I mean, there wasn't any reprieve. And the king gets up and walks. You Can't you see him? He walks out. He's, he, he's, he's angry, and he knows he's perplexed now what to do. He realizes what Haman has done. He's trapped him into the killing of his own queen. And I would imagine, I don't know, I've never heard anybody say this, but I bet all these things are running through his mind. Honor the king. I've put on his robe, put on his crown. He thinks it's him. He's, and now he's after, if he can kill the queen, he knows she's Jewish. I didn't know. And so now he's going to take this, and he's close to the, he's, he's seeing espionage. He's seeing treason. And when he turns his back, Haman falls at Esther's feet because he sees the king's countenance is against him. Please, Queen Esther, I plead for my life. I plead for my life. While a gallows is standing in his yard in the middle of the, of the town to hang Mordecai. Please. The king comes in and he's got her. He's holding her garments, begging her. The king sees him. He says, would he try to force the queen in my house? They grabbed him. Pulled him up and he said, he said, what should we do? And one of his guards said, there is a gallows 50 cubits out there ready to hang Mordecai, the Jew who saved your life. He said, hang him on it. And they covered his face, hung him on it. And the king's perplexed. He don't know what to do to say because the, the word and the decree can't be changed. She, Esther begs, but he, but he knows this is what's bothering him. So he tells Mordecai. He tells Esther, here, and he gives Mordecai his ring. He says, you write another decree for whatever you want and seal it. Well, now the fights, the fight is in the law. The fight's in the law. And so Mordecai writes another one and sends it out in the king's signet. On that day, all the Jews are, are, are permitted to arm themselves and defend themselves. And, who, and whoever, you know, whoever attacks them, this is going to happen to them and this and that. He's writing a decree that makes people think twice before they do this. And so he, it's the battle of the two edicts written. And so sure enough, they go out, but the Jews prevail and even take land and take more. And they do more. And people started wanting to be a Jew that wasn't even a Jew. And Haman was gone. And the gallows he sought to hang Mordecai on, he was hanged on. And his sons were killed. So, so here is... This is what happens in the time to speak. And the Jew Mordecai became the king's chancellor. And think about that. And so in this time, edicts have been written against God's people and righteousness is attempted to be overthrown. And I believe at least in the prophetic connotation, when that ship hit that bridge at the Francis Scott Key Bridge, it was an attack against freedom on this soil. You say, well, we don't know if anybody attacked. I, I said it, was, it had prophetic connotations, prophetic overtones in the spirit. It's, being, it's, it's shown to us what's happening. And so in this time, it's time for God's people to speak. 
Speak out for righteousness. Yeah, but, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come after me. Well, if you don't speak, who knows if you wasn't brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. Speak the word. Speak righteous things. Do righteous things. Talk about righteousness. Talk about the covenants. Do things, live like a believer. Hallelujah. Live like a believer. Live like, live like you're supposed to. Yes. Now let me see if I can find this and I'll close with this. Hallelujah. I'm looking. I'm looking. I will find it. No, that's not it. That ain't it. That ain't either. Nope. Nope. Hold on. We're getting there. Praise God. We are getting there. Amen. Now, so we talked about how time is a precious commodity. And people, men, demons, and Satan, they all want to control it and control the time. Because time is like a bunch of little wounds in, this, in the unseen world. And there's a time to sow something into that that will produce. There's a time you sow into that that will produce. And so time, there's a time and a season for every purpose under the heaven. Now we as Christians, it's a time now to speak. We must make our stand for righteousness. It's a righteous stand for us or it's no stand at all. What does a righteous stand look like? Well, we read about Esther and her righteous stand. And we, we read about the results of a righteous stand. So what does a righteous stand look like? We must stand and boldly proclaim. It's a time to speak. What do we proclaim? Abortion is wrong. We should proclaim that. We have to stand and say that. There's no box you can put the killing of, of unborn children in marked right. That's an unrighteous act. People say, well, we got a right. We got a right. Yes, you do. You have rights to do what's right. And murder is wrong. And child sacrifice is, is wrong. It's never been right. Killing babies is wrong. Now, this is not debatable. In the Christian world. Now this is, this is really something, y'all. And I know this. Well, this is, you know, this is 11th hour has gone a long time. It's late. It's later than you think it is. This is not debatable in our world. This is a non-debatable subject in our world. Killing babies is wrong. You as Christians cannot endorse this. What bar, ma, uh, box marked right do you put that sin in? Would you have, as a believer, offered children to Baal in the Old Testament? Planned Parenthood is, sim is simple. It's simply the modern altar of the ancient false god Baal. As a Christian, same-sex marriage is wrong. We have to stand up for that. We have to proclaim that. God created male and female, a man and his wife. From the beginning, it was this way. As a Christian, we do not endorse or embrace the woke agenda. The woke agenda was spewed straight out of hell itself. Transgenderism is wrong. There's not many genders. There's only two. It's very simple, male and female. It doesn't matter whether you believe that you're a man if you're really a woman. You're still a woman. It doesn't matter if you believe you're a woman. If you're really a man, you're still a man. 
If they dug up your bones 150 years from now, it doesn't matter how many operations you've had to make yourself another gender. When they find you, they will say by your skeleton, that is a man or that is a woman. Your truth does not matter. The truth is what will stand. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. We read about that. Genesis 3.15 is where the woke agenda started. It was when the serpent said to the woman, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Your eyes shall be opened, or you will become woke. But it didn't stop there. It went on to say you shall be as gods. As gods to determine things like you may be born a woman, but you are as gods. You can be a man. So we have to, as Christians, stand up in our time to speak for what is right. We have to stand, make our stand of righteousness. And this is how you stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that's all today on the 11th hour. I hope you got a lot out of that. And we are in the time of Purim. And we, we just came out of it. And um, we see a lot of things happening in the world. All of them have prophetic significance. And more will come out as the time goes. And you'll see. Hallelujah. Um, hidden things will be brought to light. Mark 11. I mean Mark uh, chapter 4 verse 22. Hidden things will be brought to light. There's always light in the land of Goshen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Krista, are you receiving the offering today? So come on and um, just take hold of this mic. And I have, I have covered some ground here. <laughs> That's a fact. Ground has been covered. Amen. Well, we want to thank you all for tuning in today to the 11th hour. You know, um, Esther is probably one of my all-time favorite books of the Bible. Uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to pick a favorite book of the Bible. It's like when people come up to me and they, they ask me, they say, well, what's your favorite song you've ever written? And I said, I, I can't really answer that because there are... I love them all for different reasons. And because they're all special and unique, the Lord gave them to me for different reasons. That's the way I feel about the scripture is it's very hard for me to pick a favorite because they're all so special in different ways. And they're intended to be like that or they wouldn't be split up into books. So, um, you know, Esther, it's just one though that I gravitated to a, a little bit more Number one, because, I mean, she's a shero, is what we would, we would call. I mean, she really is a real-life superhero yeah. because she saved her people. And Esther is a big reason why we're all here today still because she opened her mouth and told the truth. You know, that's the biggest thing. Not that she just opened her mouth to speak, but she opened her mouth and told the truth. She didn't lie to the king. She didn't lie to him and she risked her own life. But the truth won. The truth won and it came out victorious. And, you know, that's what I've been thinking about throughout this 11th hour is, you know, um, about the hidden things and, and, and different things coming to life. What was the word that we kept using? Um, it was during one of the songs. It was just a continuous word. But... It's basically hidden things are going to be brought to light because the truth will win in the end. Read the back of this book. There's another book called Revelation. Read that one. <laughs> Read that one and you find out that the truth does win. The truth wins. When it's all said and done, the truth wins. And what is the truth? This book right here. The Word of God, this is the truth, and everything in it is the truth. And you can scream that it's not. You can say 2 plus 2 is 5. You can scream it until you're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, you're going to be the one that looks like the idiot because 2 plus 2 is 4. 
and it doesn't, it, your opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't change that. Well, you can scream that the Word of God is not true. You can scream that Christianity is not real. You can scream that Jesus is not the only way. You can scream that heaven's not real. You can scream all of these things until you're blue in the face, but when it's all said and done, you're going to be the one who looks like the idiot because it's all true. And it doesn't change. Your opinion doesn't change that. It doesn't change where it comes from. And I believe that everything in this book is true, including give and it shall be given unto you. Why? Because Jesus said it. And it doesn't, he actually said that. Those are the words in red in Luke 6, 38. He actually said that. He actually uttered those words out of his mouth here on the very planet that you and I stand on. He uttered those words, and so it doesn't matter what you scream. It doesn't matter what you say about the offering. It doesn't matter what you say about, about anything concerning prosperity because it, it doesn't change that it's the truth. And it actually it will work, and it will stand when everything else falls. Why? Because it's the Word of God, the ultimate truth. And so... You know, if we take anything, too, from Esther, especially as women, the women who are, are watching right now, then we have to not only speak with boldness, but we have to speak the truth. You know, the world's got women who are, are screaming all kinds of stuff. Well, God needs us. He needs us to stand up and speak the truth. You know, I mean, well, you've got women screaming, my body, my choice, my body, my choice, all this kinds of stuff. Okay, yeah, sure. And your, your choice about your body has serious consequences. The choice that you make about it, it's better for you that a millstone be tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. It's better for you. Those that just continue to be screaming and screaming and screaming, my body, my choice, hold up the signs, all this kind of stuff. Well, well that baby's body is a whole separate body, and, and you really don't have the right to do that, and your choice that you're making has serious consequences. And that's the truth coming from this woman. Your choice has serious repercussions. But if, now if you're on the other side of that camera, and I don't know why I'm saying this, if you're on the other side of that camera and you think, well, I, I made that choice before I made Jesus the Lord of your life, well, that choice that you made to make Jesus the Lord of your life overpowers that other choice that you make, and it will cancel it out completely and totally because uh, not only did you receive Jesus, but you received grace and mercy, and you received forgiveness of, of all of your sin, and that, that choice that you made right there just cancels that out, so don't you even worry about that. You just go on with your life and prosper and prosper and know that that child is waiting on you in heaven. And so don't you worry about that anymore today. Don't let your mind be at peace because when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, that was the ultimate choice to make. And with that comes prosperity, spirit, soul, and body, spiritually, physically, financially, and you today can walk free. You can walk free. And if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, then it's as simple as doing this. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. And if, just to add something with it, say, take my life and do something with it. And my friends, if you said that prayer today, you're not just my friends, but you're now my family in Christ Jesus. And today starts forever of the rest of your life and a prosperous life at that.
Now go on. You've just accepted the ultimate prosperity in your life. Now to put that into material things in your life because now you have the power on the inside of you to bring wisdom, to bring knowledge, and you can now live on earth as it is in heaven. You have the power to do that now by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior to bring heaven to earth. You really do. That's the truth also. And he says in Luke 6, 38, he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, and I call it done in Jesus' name. Now for the tither, uh, if you're a brand new born again Christian, then I, I encourage you to go and study the tithe and I encourage you to really pray about it. Obviously, I can't tell you, yes, yes, you need to tithe, you need to, but I can encourage you from my own life and let you know that when you connect that part to heaven, you connect that part of your finances to the kingdom of God, I'm telling you, it can end up saving more than just your finances. Why? Because he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So if you're brand new, Go study it out. You're not, you're not going to regret it. I promise you that. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, and I call it done. In Jesus' name, amen, so be it. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. You know, you know, that is, that is so true about you know, people say, my body, my choice, but that's not your body. That's a baby's body, so therefore it's not your choice. And uh, it should have a right to live. And uh, so if you're thinking about making that kind of decision, that's who I'm talking to right now, then you, you need to rethink that. And uh, God has a purpose and a plan for that child and for you with that child. And, and just think about it, to be part of a destiny that could change the world. You don't know what's ahead for that child. Hallelujah. And, and you can't, you don't want to be, you know, the ultimate tyrant. The ultimate tyranny is to kill people with their hands behind their back. Where they can't fight back, they can't do anything. That child can't do anything to defend itself. And when they show it actually on the screen, it shows it trying to get away. And uh, so you don't want to let the enemy fool you into that. We have 4D now, sonars and things, that it's obvious they can't lie to us anymore and say it's not a child because you can see it. So if you have done that, Krista told you, there's forgiveness in the blood and a way to start completely over. But if you're, if you're thinking about doing that now, think on these things. Your, your body, your choice, but that's not your body, so therefore it's not your choice. Hallelujah. You had the choice before that became a body inside you. Now let it have a choice and a life. Amen. It's not an it, it's a child. Now, I want to, uh, I want to also tell you that if you're born again, you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, something the devil has no clue about. You just say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then just start saying, praising, and then saying the sounds you hear in your heart. And you start praying mysteries hidden in God. <coughs> now, 
that person that just made fun of me speaking in tongues. Uh, I, I'm really, I pray you did that in ignorance. So don't, I wouldn't do that. That's not a good thing to do. You know, they tried to say that day at Pentecost that they were, these men are drunk. That was in ignorance. He said, no, no, we're not drunk as you suppose. See, and it's just nine in the morning. He said, but we're filled with the Holy Ghost. This is the promise. So you just begin to pray the mind and the mysteries of God. And you know this is a good time. Roxanne, I want you to come up and take a, your mic again just for a moment. This is a good time right here that all of those people that were killed in, in Russia in that terrorist attack, all those families, of those people that were killed, those that died when that bridge collapsed in Maryland, the families of those people. These are the two main tragedies right now that we see happening that just happened. We need to lift those families up in prayer today. We really do. And we don't know what it will take to comfort their precious hearts over their family members. You have no idea what it would have been like to have been w uh, waked up and said, this is what just happened to your family. You absolutely, it, it, we don't even want to know such a thing. So the only comfort they can have, the Holy Ghost knows how to do that. And the scripture says if we pray in the Spirit, that we, he prays, he, it's him taking hold together with us against our infirmities and we're praying for things that we don't know how to pray for. So, Roxanne, I want you to come out here and just, just come here. We're in the center there somewhere. And, and I want you to pray. And we're going to begin to pray for all those families. And that happened at that theater. I'm not sure what that was, some kind of concert hall in Russia and happened at that, when that barge hit that bridge this morning, those family members that are going to have to deal with this mm -hmm. and the tragedies that it's happened. So let's just pray in the spirit over them. You lead us in that. And we're just going to intercede for those families. Yes, Mostra fahe so dre bra se elo kindi firedia elo him prahe de safanti de brook to kota hai babasha tera fit sunder brookotile avades and the fakishi tera ba boso de de yela hai in the brookote te bro diet na hi fruto de shindra bakaledi elo him brahen de reves so so de bretis savaresepa. Medo di apri de si ter vurto ro kunchiti shi prata hindro kuto hul ne vesa dara ya dara vindro kula la ya dara fasa ah fe so sala le ndi dara ya frandi kite shata ma di viso tera yela la vaya te de asota hinte ki kala hinte so si bredo she zai tendo yela ya kendo sai she fetota. Baza vasi pidera broto shindrifika ha haya halayendra hai baye broto sale kando da yevri hikdi shindi bidi desai bedosi baye te pokol na yende vesi papa ila de desai te ma di bo si pra baye hipa kante pe dry every tear Lord dry every tear of the family members that woke up this morning, Lord, to hear of the tragedy at the bridge. Dry the tears, Lord, of those in Moscow, Russia, wherever this was, Lord, exactly. Lord of mothers, grandmothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, Lord, that, that have to live now with the memories of how their families and their family members died. Lord, dry their tears because we do not know or have a clue what it takes to dry their tears and to just say, 
be comforted is not enough. So, Lord, I ask you to minister to them in their very depth that these family members would be comforted, lifted up, and upheld, Lord. Lord, those that say they had no idea when they went to work this morning or last night that would happen. Those who had no idea when they went to this concert that would happen. Lord God, I ask you to comfort them to their very core. Give them the peace that passes all understanding. The peace of God that rules in the hearts of men. Lord, not just in their capital cities, politicians and politics, but the peace that passes all understanding. Lord God, take what was prayed in the Spirit today and let it go into the hearts and the spirits of all those that are facing this pain now. And I give you praise and honor and glory. And I pray it in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roxanne. I just wanted to to be sure we prayed for these families before we went, ended the program today. And you pray as the Lord leads you to pray. And when that heaviness comes on you and you, you begin to pray, you know, yesterday I had other plans to do something, but it was on me all day. And all I could hear was meet me in the temple at the 11th hour. And then we wake up to this tragedy today at the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And he wrote our anthem, our, you know, that we sing it everywhere. We sing it at ball games. We sing it at different things. And so I want you to, to uplift those families. And um, the Lord, uh, that's what I was, had to have been picking up on yesterday that I had to be here today. Amen. Rest assured, God has not forgotten you. Neither will he ever. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here.